Welcome. Welcome to Western University Presents the Walrus Talks Storytelling. I'm Shelley Ambrose, the Executive Director of the Walrus. We're thrilled to be here on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Leopawak, and the Attawandaran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and the Sombre Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. We're also very thrilled to be here back in this gorgeous theater, and I want to thank artistic director Dennis Garnum and his team for all of their support. Dennis Garnum, I think, is right there. Hello, Dennis Garnum. <laughs> Woohoo! I've known Dennis for oh, almost 20 years. We met when we were both working in New York, and then he went to my hometown of Calgary at Theater Calgary for a while, and then uh, he has been here doing great and amazing things, Holy Mary Poppins, all sorts of great things. Are there any um, grand theater subscribers in the room? There you all are. And what about the rest of you? What's going on next time I come? All hands up. So we know there's a very rich history of sharing and conversation and storytelling here in this room, and we're thrilled to be here to continue that tradition. This optimistic little project called The Walrus started 16 years ago. And at The Walrus, we recognize that Canada's conversation is complex and necessary. And so it takes many forms at The Walrus. We create conversations through fact-based journalism at The Walrus Magazine and at thewalrus.ca. We didn't used to have to say fact-based journalism. <laughs> we used to just say journalism. But um, we need you to know that we're, everyone says they're in the fact business, but we're actually in the fact checking business with real live human fact checkers. We also uh, create conversation at the Walrus by publishing the Walrus books and by producing events like this from coast to coast to coast uh, with the Walrus talks. And no matter where the Walrus is or how it is consumed, we embrace our commitment to be independent and to bring together interesting and interested people about uh, who care about the issues that matter. So hands up if you read The Walrus. Hands up if you subscribe. Those are my people. <laughs> right there, you can meet those people after. Um, hands up if you've attended a Walrus Talks before. Welcome back. Hands up if you're new. Let's welcome the new people. Yay. Thank you for coming. One of the things we know at the Walrus is that uh, time uh, is really your, your um, biggest non-renewable resource. So we are very happy when you've chosen to spend some time with us. We're also really thrilled to be once again working with our friends at Western University and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. I am a Western alum, Bachelor of Arts, 1983. Okay, yes. Who was not born in 1983? Put it up here, out oh, there, see? That happens now. Any other Western alum in the room? Western alum, yay. What about students and faculty? Existing Mustangs, there you all are. Can see your purple from here. Thank you for being with us. So we've been working with Western alumni in arts and humanities. I actually sit on the board um, of SASA at Western. And we've been working with them for several years. And I wanna thank Western for making tonight possible for their commitment to Canada's conversations. And I would like to welcome a longtime friend of the Walrus, the new President and Vice Chancellor of Western, the stellar Dr. Alan Shepard. Good evening, bonsoir. Great to be with you this evening. We have a couple of other speakers who are also Western graduates. Carol will be speaking, and Eternity will also be speaking. Um, I have a long history with the Walrus. Shelley and I go way back, and we've been all over the world, well, all over Canada, doing Walrus talks. We had a great one in Calgary on the subject of vice. And it turned out that a whole bunch of Calgarians wanted to come out in the dead of winter, and I mean it was January, uh, to hear about naughty topics. Uh, go figure. That's Canada for you. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a new resident of London, as you heard, and I'm so thrilled to be here. I feel already right at home. Glad to be, glad to be at Western. 
Um, just to say that Western's proud to be sponsoring this with the uh, Walrus this evening. Um, our commitment to uh, independent journalism and commitment to uh, independent thinking uh, is, a, is an amazing thing. And since I'm a refugee from the United States, not to be taken lightly. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Dr. Shepard, and thank you, Western University. As you can tell at The Walrus, we take storytelling quite seriously. Providing forums for different perspectives and narratives is our actual reason for being. So this evening in this forum, you will hear seven perspectives on storytelling. And here is how The Walrus Talks works. There are seven talkers. They each have seven minutes. They know this. You each have a program in your hand. We keep the lights up. We would like you to hold that program and follow along. The speaker order is on the front. Their bios are on the back. I will not stand up in between each talker and read aloud to you. So please follow along. They will introduce themselves. You will hear seven talkers for seven minutes each in a row. And once your head is filled with new ideas, we will have lots to talk about at the post-talks reception to which you are all invited. So just before I let them get underway, I'd like to thank all of our talkers in advance. Thank you to author and editor Casey Plett. Thank you to author and scholar Jesse Thistle. Thank you to journalist and Western alum, Eternity Martis. Thank you to screenwriter, playwright, and actor, Susan Coyne. Thank you to comedian, Courtney Gilmore. Thank you to author, playwright, screenwriter, and London resident, Emma Donahue. And thank you to journalist, author, co-host of CBC Radio's As It Happens, and Western alum, Carol Off. And thank you all for coming. Let us begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Casey Plett. I am a writer and an editor. And today I want to talk to you about bravery, um, specifically two things. First of all, I want to talk about uh, when bravery or courage uh, is a farce, a false story, something we tell ourselves to fool ourselves. And then second, I want to talk about when bravery or courage is real and a necessary fount of personal strength um, and increasingly uh, a must, I would say, in our um, increasingly horrifying world. Um, a housekeeping note before I start, I will be talking about my experience as a transgender woman to illustrate what I believe about bravery just because it is my personally easiest way into the subject, but this is what I believe about bravery in every sense and not just in relation to transsexuality. Uh, so number one, when bravery is a farce. Let me tell you, um, so when I, when I first came out, um, as trans, and that was about over a decade ago, um, there was this phrase that I heard all the time. You're so brave. And it was always said by a very sweet, well-meaning person. Um, the idea behind it, I suppose, was that in a transphobic world that does not largely understand trans people, um, that to simply come out and transition is de facto a brave act. Uh, on its surface, sure, this, this idea can, can make a lot of sense, and yet inside me, um, it, it always felt a little off the mark. It rankled me inside. Now, back then, I couldn't have fully said why, but I think I could have articulated this. It felt false. Uh, there was something intrinsically false about this very nice compliment that very nice people were attempting to give me. Eventually, um, I started talking to other trans people about this, a lot of whom had the same experience, and um, they heard the yeah, it's so, you're so brave, um, in, in the same way. And they felt the same way that I did. Um, it felt wrong to be as assigned bravery in this way, um, perhaps because most of us had once tried not to be trans or not to transition, and that had brought us to the end of a very short road. Um, and I, I would say, actually, this experience is so consistent that in, so, that in, that in some trans subcultures, brave is actually like kind of a loaded word. Um, one friend had this analogy, if you will uh, indulge me with it. Um, imagine like, you know, you're, you're running from a bear through a forest and, and the bear, like it's gaining on you and you know there's a cabin just a little ways away. Um, but the bear is faster than you, and it's faster than you, and you don't know if you're going to make it. Um, and then all of a sudden, miraculously, there's that cabin. You get in, you slam the door, you lock it just in time, you're leaning against the door, you're panting, your life has flashed before your eyes. And, and a person inside turns and says, like, wow, you're so brave for outrunning that bear. <laughs> or 
as a short story by Laurie Moore said um, in, a, in a completely different context, uh, quote, everyone admires us for our courage. They have no idea what they are talking about. Courage requires options, end quote. Uh, that is from a story, by the way, called People Like Us Are the Only People Here. It's very good. Um, and indeed, I would agree with that. And um, that seems to make sense to me. And yet, there's a second side to this bravery idea. Because two, if I think, about, if I think inside myself, I know I have done brave and courageous things in my life when I didn't have to. Um, like, um, and, and it'll, you know, it all, it's almost seems to me now like a silly example, but um, I kept thinking about it I was, as I was writing this, the first time that I had the guts to go wear a dress outside on a crowded city street, get on the bus, get on the train, I just knew strangers were gonna react in some way and I, and I wasn't quite sure. Um, I remember the first day that I did that. And in retrospect, if I really think about it, if I feel inside me what that feeling was, I suppose it was something like bravery that got me out of the house because I didn't have to leave the house that day. And it's funny, you know, I, I thought about that over other traumas that I have survived that were uh, far grimmer than anxiously wearing a dress on a bus. Um, but with those, those, those other traumas, they were events that uh, they just happened to me and I survived them, but I didn't really have a choice in the matter. But choosing to leave the house on that particular day, like sure, okay, 13 years later, I will think about that time and I feel it to me and I think, okay, I, if I had to, sure, yes. Maybe that was brave, and maybe no one else knew it, but I knew it. And my memory of what it feels like to summon that courage is an unseen thing. It is personal, and it is deep inside me. And it exists in no relation to whether someone hears a story and says, yeah, wow, that was really brave of you. It's a, it's a story inside of me that, it, that it's, as a storyteller, it, it, it's not, I'm not sure it's one I can even give to someone else. I think, as humans, I was trying to think about the farcical side of bravery and the true, real side of courage. I think, as humans, it feels very comforting when we assign bravery and other people. Um, and, 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 I, and I feel that feeling. I feel it all the time. Um, you know, um, people who are really putting skin on the line for environmental justice, that's definitely a pretty salient one lately. Uh, sex workers continuing to work and survive among increasing criminalization um, as of this week, our, you know, our nation's, uh, our nation's veterans. You know, and all those cases, I feel that feeling that bubbles up me like, oh man, you know, God bless those people. That is a pretty damn brave thing to... And then I think when I have that feeling like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know I felt weird about this when it was directed at me. And then I think... Where is that feeling coming from? When I want to assign someone bravery, when I feel that, what's causing it? And here is what I think I know. I think that when I look at other humans and I assign them bravery, I feel like I can fall back into my bed and I sleep more soundly. I question less what is needed for myself. There is a gentle, peaceful complacency that surges through my body and it feels so good. It is so much more about me than about the supposedly brave person, their actions, and how they see themselves. It is a story that operates independently of that person. And when I have that feeling, when I, when I think about it that way, you know, I don't think I like that. It doesn't feel productive to me. For me, real bravery, the good kind, the kind that is true, a story that is inside me that is powerful. It is a private experience. It is a solitary, it's an internal thing. No one can assign it to you and neither can anyone take it away. It's the kind of thing that lifts me back out of bed, lifts me out of complacency. I bring this story to you tonight in hopes that you also might question how you think of this term bravery and the next time you think that, man, that, that's, people are so brave you might ask yourself what's happening inside of you and what story you're telling to yourself and whether there's maybe another story of your own personal history inside you that's deeper. I really hate being told that I'm brave. I always will, probably. And yet bravery matters. It matters so much. And especially, uh, I would say, in this current moments of uh, 
bigotry and hate and creeping fascism, fascism and environmental collapse and doom from so many corners, I think bravery will be needed. I think it will likely be needed more than we can imagine. A real bravery is a thing that I hope for all of us in this room. Thank you. Hi, my name, my name is Jesse Thistle. I'm an academic and storyteller, a recent uh, memoirist, and uh, I'm going to talk about storytelling. Storytelling comes from experience. I'm not sure where my ability to tell stories comes from. I know storytelling runs deep within indigenous cu cultures, so when people ask me, I'd like to say that my faculty to craft narratives comes from my mystical DNA as a Métis person, but that would be both racist and eugenic. <laughs> Indigenous people are not good storytellers because of their biology or blood memory. The truth is I don't know where it comes from, but if I had to guess, I'd say that I learned my storytelling first from a white guy, my grandpa Thistle, the man who adopted me and my two brothers after my Mitchiff family fell apart when I was three. Next, I believe my time, it comes from my time as a beggar, looking for spare change. And finally, I'd say from my time now in academia, where I collect stories from Métis Cree elders. My earliest memory of storytelling is when I was eight, on summer vacation to Cape Britain with my grandparents. We were coming around the Cabot Trail, you see here, and there was this rocky mountain in amongst a crest of forested mountains. I asked my grandfather why the one had no trees. Jesse, he said in his thick Cape Britainer accent, back when I was little, I lived on the top of that mountain with me mutter. One day I was at the bottom near the sea and she called me up for supper. Fearing me brothers and sisters would eat all the food, I ran as fast as I could up the mountainside ran right out of me shoes, and on the way I tore out all the trees with me feet. <laughs> it's been bald ever since, bye. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> I pictured my grandpa bounding with his legs spinning like Fred Flintstones when he started his car. <laughs> my whole childhood is filled with incredible stories like that. He once said he coached the Maple Leafs in the early 1960s, and that's where I got my old cheese cutter skates from. He said that so I'd wear them and not feel ashamed at the rink with the other kids and their brand new skates. He once said, uh, also said that uh, him and my dog Yorkie could talk in a secret language. He did that so I wouldn't be afraid of the dog when I first came from out west. There was something in the way that he told his stories that stuck with me. The more fantastic, the better, but always with a purpose. Years later, in my early 30s, I was mixed up in drugs and booze and was homeless. My addictions were quite severe, and in between stealing and jail time, I came to realize that panhandling was relatively profitable, but it's a hard way to make a living. People have no time. You have a split second to catch their attention and to keep them interested. I started with the common stories that everyone hears. I'm hungry, need food, please give. No one believes that one. No one gives to that story. Next, I tried animating myself and made my stories more elaborate. I got kicked out of my home because there was a giant fire, a flood. Godzilla attacked us. Please donate. My hands stretched out, my eyes pitiful and dramatic. Few believed my theatrics, even fewer gave. Finally, I decided to tell people straight, listen Mac, I'm a drug addict, can't keep a job, have nowhere to go. I need money or I'll go into withdrawal and shit my pants. Neither of us want that. <laughs> a funny thing happened when I told the truth. People connected and opened their wallets. Some even took the time to tell me their stories bought me food, and once a guy offered to buy me new shoes. It didn't work every time, mind you, but I learned something critical about stories then. You gotta be quick and brave 
and tell the truth. People respect that. A few years later, after I'd gone through rehab, I found myself in university, a researcher of Indigenous history. Part of my job was to collect oral history from Métis and Cree elders in Saskatchewan. The, elder, the elders told me all kinds of interesting things about our shared history. How Whiskey Jack was tricked into eating his own scabs by the birds in an effort to make him humble. How Michif people struggled on the sides of the roads on road allowances because we stood up against Canada during the Northwest resistance only to lose and have our lands stolen and given away to settlers. And how our people learned to adapt to life without the government or any of their support, which in turn caused massive rates of tuberculosis in, in our people, a winnowing that took whole Métis families in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. The elders were master storytellers. And it wasn't just in what they said, it was in the way that they said it. They repeated concept and dates in threes so I could remember them. They took deep breaths and spoke calmly, even during traumatic stories, almost to the point of hypnotizing me. And their cadence carried the rhythm of their testimonies, bobbing like the bow of a canoe riding out the fast current of the South Saskatchewan River. From these virtuoso oral historians, I learned about timing and pace and how to listen. So there you have it. My ability to tell stories does not come from my biology or my ancestral memory as a native man, as romantic as those concepts are. It comes from my experiences in the world. From the Métis Cree elders, I learned that delivery is just as important as content. A story is also a song, a song with rhythm that one must follow and feel. From my days as a panhandler, I learned that you have to tell people straight. People know bullshit when they hear it. And from my grandpa, I learned that stories have to be fantastic to keep people interested, but always with a moral purpose. Come to think of it though, I never did figure out what the moral to my grandfather's running up the mountain story was. <laughs> Maybe he was just trying to keep me entertained, distract me from the long car ride. Maybe he was trying to impress me with his superhuman speed and strength. Or maybe he was just trying to tell me how much he loved his mother, a woman he'd literally moved mountains for. Whatever the reason, I still see him running up that mountain, and part of me still believes that he ripped out those trees with his feet. I guess I always will. And maybe that's the most important element of story. That is my grandfather's final lesson that stories have the power to make us believe. I know I do. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Eternity Martis, and I am a journalist, editor, and soon-to-be memoirist. And I am talking today about the power of personal writing and memoir for marginalized groups and young people. So when I was 22 and in my Master's of Journalism program, I was still working on my memoir about what it's like to be a student of color here at Western University. And I had been writing for four years, and I was now looking for a publisher. And in J school, I was one of the only people of color there, which sometimes felt like the stories and genres I was interested in, which was race, gender, social issues, essay writing, weren't journalistic enough. Some of my professors questioned my interests or didn't really understand the stories that I wanted to cover. A white woman in one of my classes wrote a reported personal essay on a friend of sorts who had passed away as a result of a drug overdose. Our professor, also white, was so touched that he pulled strings to get her piece published in a popular media outlet within days. He put her in touch with a major publisher as well. She had a book deal for a memoir in a week. Meanwhile, he had little feedback on my essay about the urgent need to preserve slave history in Ontario after descendants of slaves die, a history most people in Ontario don't actually know about. 
he did have one piece of advice for me, which was that I had ruined my story by putting myself in it. One day after class, I mustered up the courage to ask him if he could also put me in touch with that publisher. I had a solid book proposal, an almost finished manuscript, and my selling point, which was that every student that I knew, current or former, had harrowing stories of experiencing racism at a university or college, yet no one was really talking about it openly. So I told my professor all of this as I chased him down the hall. And when he finally stopped, he turned around and said to me, I have contacts, but I don't think they'd be interested in the things that you write about. Not interested in institutional racism in Canada? The prevalence of sexual assault on campuses? The struggles of student life for non, the struggles of student life for non-white students? Were those things and my voice and authority on them, were they not as important as what my peer had written? I quickly realized that it actually wasn't about me. It was about who got to tell stories, who were the keepers of those stories, and what stories they believed mattered to our society. And I was being told that my stories did not matter to society. But that didn't stop me, though. While I believe in luck and hard work, I also believed in what I had to say. Two years later, my essay was published by a renowned media outlet and nominated for an award. And a year after that, I had an agent, a major publisher, and a two-book deal. Great. Great. I believed in my story and its potential to help bring an important conversation out of hiding, to help bring change to our campuses, to help current and former students make sense of their own experiences. Most of all, I believed that in our cultural and political climate, personal storytelling has tremendous power. Just a few years ago, personal writing was still called lazy and self-indulgent. It was considered an illegitimate form of writing. However, that criticism has hardly ever extended to white memorists, namely white male memorists. When I first started writing my book a decade ago, I could hardly think of young LGBTQ2 people or young people of color who had the opportunity to have their memoirs published. And even now, when they are published, their reviews are driven down by racists and homophobes who don't feel they deserve to have the same space to tell those stories. And they aren't held to a higher standard because the quality of their writing is poor. It isn't. They're held to a higher standard because it's assumed that people like us can't ever produce quality writing. Memoir has been regarded as something that is only unlocked after a certain kind of experience and privilege has been attained. It disregards young and marginalized people by saying, you're too young, what do you know? You haven't achieved enough yet. You haven't been through enough yet. You haven't lived long enough yet to know pain. You're ungrateful, be happy for what you have. If you don't like your life here, go back to where you came from. Your experiences don't matter. They call us what they call our personal writing, lazy, self-indulgent, and whiny. Yet this generation of young people, millennials as we call them, has faced more obstacles and hardships, arguably, than the last generation. We're told to spend thousands of dollars to get a degree in a shaky economy that guarantees no job and makes it impossible to be a homeowner, let alone find affordable housing. Our world, and along with it, our future, is rapidly burning right before our eyes. We're the era that grew up with school shootings and lockdowns. Women in their early 20s are the most at risk of interpartner violence and sexual assault in Canada. And young black, brown, and indigenous men are most at risk of police brutality and carding. Our generation is more likely to be gender fluid even as LGBTQ2 rights are being taken away, seemingly by the day. Young people of all ages and genders are most at risk of cyberbullying and cyberstalking and mental health issues. And hate crimes have doubled in Canada over the last year and have gone up half here in London. And for students, they are facing a slew of far-right extremism on campuses. So if I might indulge myself, I'm inclined to say our experiences matter. Personal storytelling has been crucial to the evolution of society since ancient times and its legacy has ha helped pass on culture, tradition, and history. It's been a means of sharing truth for the most marginalized and oppressed, from slave accounts to memoirs by residential school survivors. Today's personal writing echoes centuries of others who have written their experiences into existence, 
from what it means to be black today in 2019, drawing parallels to the 60s civil rights movement, to Me Too stories drawing from previous waves of feminism and womanism. Personal writing braids together centuries of individual stories of hardship and triumph, exposing the, the collective injustices that we all face. It shows us that as much as history has changed for the better, much of it has stayed the same. Personal writing binds our realities, offering possibilities for belonging, for healing, and for a better future. Writing your story in this climate is critical. And at a time when so many of us are dehumanized by those with power, putting our story into the public record is an act of resistance. Disadvantaged groups, whether it be people of color, immigrants, queer, trans, and two-spirit folks, young people, we're being pushed into silence through harassment, violence, and a loss of power. Also that oppressors can maintain control of the narrative and stereotypes that we are less deserving, less important, and less powerful than we actually are. But they cannot take our words from us. By simply sharing our experiences with the rest of the world, we have the innate power to make the oppressive systems around us start to crumble. Our words put cracks in the structures that keep us locked out and unable to form our own narratives. Time and again, history has shown that our words, whether carved into stone or inked into paper or typed up for a blog, can spark change in our society and inspire future generations to act, think, and make sense of their own experiences. A week ago, I told a cousin that my memoir was coming out this March, and he said, you haven't even been on this earth long enough to write a memoir. What could you possibly be writing about? And I told him, I'm writing about a life worth writing about. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Coyne. I work as both an actor and a playwright and a screenwriter, so I spend my life immersed in stories, thinking about how they work, what makes them compelling, and why we crave them so. Lately, I've been working in what's called a writer's room in Hollywood. That's where a group of people sit around a table full of sugary snacks and uh, map out an entire season of television on a whiteboard. We do this day after day for months on end, until miraculously we come up with 10 or 20 or 22 scripts, however many the order is for. One of the things that's most surprising to me about writing for TV and other screenplays is how technical it is. First of all, there's the problem of uh, page count. That means around 60 pages for an hour-long drama or 45 for an hour of network TV or 22 for a three-camera sitcom. Then there's the structure of the story itself. There must be a teaser to grab the viewer's attention, and after that, the stakes must continue to climb, and there must be an all-is-lost moment in the middle, and then it must all resolve in a satisfying way on page 58, or, in the case of Netflix, create an insatiable urge to binge the rest of the series. <laughs> Additionally, each episode must further the emotional arc of the three or four or five main characters. Now, I'm speaking about serialized television with sitcoms or medical dramas or legal shows. It's the opposite. At the end of each episode, the show resets, and we're right back where we started from. As a result of all these technical demands, there are now a vast number of books which purport to teach you the secret to screenwriting. And I know this because I'm embarrassed to say I have most of them. <laughs> Why? First, because reading them is much easier than sitting down and actually writing. And secondly, because I have a truly irrational hope that somewhere, someone can tell me how to make it less painful. Most of these books base their ideas on the work of Joseph Campbell, whose book, The Hero with the Thousand Faces, identified what became as known as the monomyth, the idea that nearly every culture's mythical framework shares certain common archetypes and structure. And his work gained popularity when George Lucas, the writer of Star Wars, cited Campbell as a major influence. One of these best-selling screenwriting gurus, a former executive at Disney, has helpfully boiled Campbell's work down to 12 elements that he thinks must be part of every story. 
And if you're thinking of writing a screenplay, here they are. The Ordinary World, The Call to Adventure, Refusal of the Call, Meeting with the Mentor, Crossing the First Threshold, Tests, Allies and Enemies, Approach to the Innermost Cave, The Ordeal, The Reward, The Road Back, The Resurrection, Return with the Elixir. You're welcome. <laughs> I enjoy writing for television, but this obsession with structure can feel a lot like math which is where everything seems to end up these days, with an algorithm. My heart sank when I read that a group of researchers had recently asked a computer to identify how many types of stories there are, based on nearly 2,000 works of fiction. The answer, six. <laughs> six, really, just six. It seems that the more money is at stake, the more there will be people who are trying to figure out a formula and writers who will feel pressured to apply it. Which is why I like to return to my first love here in the theater. Theater is the opposite in every way of an algorithm. It is analog, not digital. It happens in real time in front of real people. A play's structure evolves out of the subject matter, not the other way around. It is as basic as storytelling can be. There's a book we all read in theater school called The Empty Space by Peter Brook. The book's first line is famous. I can take an empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him, and this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged. Brooks been labeled an avant-garde director, but in fact his whole aim was to return the theater to its origins in ritual and myth, to what he called holy theater. And this was in contrast to what he called deadly theater and I probably don't need to, talk, to explain what that is to you. I'm sure we've all experienced it, and here let me say there is nothing, nothing worse than being in a bad production. I, I don't know why, but it is the worst, and I'm sure that never happens here, by the way. <laughs> As Brooke pointed out, theater and religion have a lot in common. Both have costumes, actors or priests, an audience, a congregation, a temple, the theater, and a liturgy, which in the theater is called a script. But of course, the theater is not a church. It offers no dogma, no prescriptions for how to behave. It will not save your soul. It is or ought to be an experience both sacred and profane, transcendent and deeply human. To state the obvious, theater is live. Audiences and performers share the same space, breathe the same air. And what happens in the best situations is a kind of alchemy. In fact, researchers have found that watching a live theater performance can synchronize your heartbeat with other people in the audience, regardless of whether you know them or not, producing a common physiological experience. This doesn't surprise me. I remember as an actor at Stratford, I used to peek out at the audience at the end of our performance of King Lear to watch the faces of the audience, to watch how their expressions mirrored those of the actors, no longer individuals, but a community of believers. And this is what makes storytelling in the theater unique. Richard Eyre ran the National Theater for many years and has written extensively about theater. Recently, he wrote, why is the theater an important art form today? Because it's an expression of our humanness. Because it can't be digitized. It's irreproducible. It can't be stored or recorded. It's live, unrepeatable, ephemeral, even at its greatest. It happens in the present tense and lives on only in the memory. It can never resolve its reliance on the scale of the human figure and the sound of the human voice and our desire to tell each other stories. Because when you go to the theater, you go in as an individual and you emerge as an audience. We live in what's often called the golden age of television. And at the same time, we're living through an epidemic of loneliness. I wonder if there isn't a connection as we become increasingly isolated, staying at home in front of our screens, are we missing what is most essential to storytelling, the presence of other people? What theaters offer us is perhaps an antidote, a place where our imaginations can meet and mingle together in real time, where our hearts can beat as one, where we can become, for a short time, a community. 
It's something that television, no matter how golden, can never do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Courtney Gilmore. I am a stand-up comedian. On a somewhat related note, I am also an amputee. I find that this is a very good pairing for comedy. Comedian, amputee, the two go hand in hand. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I was born missing hands and my right leg below the knee. Somehow, none of this was detectable on any of the prenatal ultrasounds. I like to think it was because I'm an amazing prankster and I know my angles. <laughs> We've always thought that for babies to be happy, healthy, and normal, they have to have 10 fingers and 10 toes. And then I came along to stir shit up. <laughs> Throughout my life, beginning very early, I have been told stories about who I am. As I navigated the world, I routinely heard certain words used to describe me, the same ones over and over, brave, strong, positive. There was always subtext behind these words, innocu innocuous enough in motive, but powerfully telling in narrative. Examples include a woman who once told me, it's hard to believe you're disabled, you're so pretty. <laughs> a man at a bus stop who tapped me on the shoulder, prompting me to remove my headphones only for him to say, God is going to reward your patience with hands someday. <laughs> In the moment, I hadn't thought to tell him that by this point, after 30 years, I would have much preferred an espresso machine. From inquisitive strangers to old ladies blessing my heart for being able to shove a piece of pizza in my face, I learned over the years that my presence in the world was inspiring people in a way that didn't sit right with me. As a side note, I generally don't enjoy being celebrated for mundane tasks. However, sometimes even I have my moments where even I am impressed at how well I can shave my armpits. <laughs> I don't want to brag or anything, but you put me in a Gillette razor on America's Got Talent. <laughs> I'm getting the golden buzzer, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Still though, I can't honestly say that I didn't light up a bit over people's accolades. I liked the fact that I was brightening people's day, but at the same time I was confused. What exactly did they think I was accomplishing? I didn't understand. Was I not just like everyone else? I mean, I had my own apartment. I had a cat. I had 42 rotten bananas in my freezer. <laughs> and yet, these interactions with strangers, friends, even family members were telling me otherwise. No matter what I did or accomplished, big or small, the story was that I was under the category other. And as the other, I existed to uplift people and remind them of how good their lives are in comparison. And I believed that story. I read it to myself every day. I felt like an amorphous blob moving through life, collecting definitions of myself from everyone around me, but not me. I lined my pages with them eagerly. Courtney joined the running club at school. She's such an inspiration. Courtney's taking dance lessons this year. She's such a trooper. Surely these laurels were worthy of aspiring to. They weren't being awarded to me, they were being awarded to me by normies, or as I like to call able-bodied people, handies. Uh, as long as they approved of me, gave me pats to the head, felt gratitude for my presence, I was doing something right. I've always naturally valued positivity and optimism not as an amputee, but just as a person, and a Leo. But I hadn't known it. I hadn't known that I was using it to perpetuate a story about disability and what it should look like. 
It wasn't until I moved away from home to go to university and sunk into the deepest, lowest depression of my life that I realized I had no idea who I was. My way of being was performative. I had a bottle of prescription pills that gave me a sense of comfort and power. I slept with the bottle under my pillow at night. I took them with alcohol, then not at all, then with alcohol, for days, weeks. Sometimes I took just one too many, just to see. I remember standing in my bathroom, holding them up to the mirror, feeling both thrilled and relieved, just knowing that if I really wanted, they could be my way out. I could control this if I really wanted to. Just knowing that some nights was enough to help me sleep. I spiraled into misery, substance abuse, self-harm, only to come up for air long enough to wonder, is this allowed? Am I allowed to be depressed? But I'm so brave, so strong, so inspiring. Who am I without that story? I read an article that changed my life. It was called Inspiration Porn and the Objectification of Disabled People, followed by a TED Talk called I'm not, in, you're, I'm not Your Inspiration, Thank You Very Much, both by the late Stella Young, an Australian writer, comedian, and disability rights activist. I was awestruck at this spunky blonde woman in a wheelchair with killer heels and a killer wit, perfectly encapsulating everything I had been secretly feeling about how we are not disabled by condition, but rather by the structures and attitudes of society. She was brash, blunt, an outspoken atheist. I had never seen this side of disability before. It wasn't sweet or proper, bowing down to saccharine platitudes. It was honest, real, multifaceted. I had found a new cause to champion. I was going to be the least inspirational person anyone had ever met. <laughs> I spent years thrashing against the system, embittered now any time I was congratulated for fun functioning adequately as a human being. You should expect more from me, I would shoot scathingly to a poor woman at the grocery checkout line. <laughs> but soon enough, that bitterness became exhausting, and slivers of sunshine peeked through. I realized as much as I admired Stella and her perspective, trying to become her wasn't the solution either. I was just so sick of being assigned happiness and positivity and bravery by others that I went the opposite way to make a point. Truthfully, I did want to inspire people. I did want to be brave, strong, positive. I wanted to make people laugh for a living, challenge myself physically, spread a message of positivity and true happiness as far and wide as possible. That's who I was all along. I just had to choose it for myself on my own terms. I had to write my own story in order to believe it. Thank you. I'm Emma Donahue. I'm from Dublin, but I've lived here for 21 years, and by here I mean right here. Well, no, not on the stage, but you know, Wortley Village, near enough. And I've been telling stories in various forms for, I think, 31 years. And um, I only got the call to take part in this gig yesterday. Um, so on the plus side, I didn't have far to come, but on the negative side, I didn't have much to say. So um, I'm hoping to make up for the unpreparedness of my remarks by the oddity of my dress. <laughs> There you go. I, I worked briefly in television. Um, I only mentioned this the other day in the hearing of my daughter, and she was suddenly, for the first time ever, impressed. She said, you worked in television? <laughs> Clearly, all the books had now not impressed her, but I worked for three months presenting a book show on Irish television. And anyway, what I found was that nobody ever remembered what I said. They just said, nice blue jacket you were wearing. So it's all about the, um, it's all about the clothes. Um, I have some observations on uh, storytelling hastily thrown together this morning over my breakfast. Um, sometimes people write to offer me stories. Um, I, I, I have a bit of a trademark shtick, I suppose, which is um, 
um, writing fact-based historical fiction, often about miserable topics, um, typically with terrible food. Whatever era or place I write about, it's, it's usually a matter of gruel in one form or another. So people will write to me and say things like, I have a great story for you to use. My great aunt in County Sligo and back in Ireland had a brutal life, molested by a priest, got TB, had 10 kids, died in the workhouse. And I have to write back to them and thank them politely, but of course, that's not really a story, is it? It's a series of unfortunate events. And in fact, in Irish history, it's even typical. So <laughs> I hate to sound too Hollywood about this, but you need a twist, you know? So I would argue that stories need a twist. And I don't necessarily mean a, a cunning twist at the ending. Um, the first time I was ever asked for a short story for an anthology, I thought, I can't do that. And I wrote back saying, I don't know how to do the twist ending. And the editor, um, Margaret Reynolds, she said to me, your, your conception of the short story clearly stopped in 1930 with O. Henry. And she's absolutely <laughs> right. So I'm not saying it has to be a twist ending, but there has to be perhaps a twist beginning, a twist somewhere, some unusual perspective, for instance. Um, I spend much of my time before I write my books just simply working out who should be the point of view character. There has to be something that makes them not obvious. Goldilocks and Red Riding Hood, for instance, they cannot simply walk on the path through the woods. They have to step off the path for something to happen. Something has to go wrong. So when our daughter at 12 says to me, why is there always a dead parent in the book? I say to her, it's just a cunning narrative device for getting the ball rolling. <laughs> Another thing I would say about stories, um, not just that they need a twist, but they are repeated. They are repeated over millennia often over generations. That's why, for instance, the easiest book I ever wrote was a book of fairy tales called Kissing the Witch. Um, and it was the easiest one I ever wrote because I was drawing on those classic European fairy tale motifs. So the plots had been not just written for me, but written by the ancestors. They'd been honed over many generations by collective memory because any bit that's not good gets forgotten by the next storyteller, gets edited out. So a story over, uh, passed on through fairy tale tradition, for instance, has many tellers, but sometimes it has just one unfortunate teller who's shackled to that tale, like the ancient mariner to his albatross. I'm thinking of my late mother. Um, I fixated as a child on one particular short story by Andrew Lang called Pinkle and the Witch. I don't know why, it's got a very rebellious young hero and a slightly sinister witch. And there's a scene where he rows himself out to the lake to try and steal her, I don't know, golden cup or something. And he, he has to muffle her sheep's bells with wool. I don't know, it's a, it's a dark story. And I asked my mother for this every night. And every night she clearly winced at the repetition. And I was the eighth child. You know, she was broken already before she got to me. But she never refused me Pinkle and the Witch. So I consider this the most important thing I, I, I've learned um, as a mother is to always say yes. So um, for instance, I pride myself on having read my 12 year old um, every single one of the How to Train Your Dragon books. And luckily they're very good, I'm not complaining. But I didn't want her ever to be able to say, you said no at book number 13. So <laughs> stories have repetition built into their DNA. I would also say stories have a form. They sometimes literally have a form. I bet each of you can remember one of your childhood favorite books, not just the story in your head, but the actual book and the actual pictures, the actual illustrations. So our son, who's now nearly 16, um, he had a favorite book, and it wasn't one of the great literary classic books that we bought him. It, you know, no, it was a book called Charlie the Crane. I looked this up on um, eBay the other day, and it's a 1988 classic in the shape of a crane. I think why he liked it is that it was, you know, the book was the shape of the thing the book was about. Um, and I tried to throw that book away at some point. I clearly, I'm a weaker vessel than my mother because even though the book was a lot shorter than um, Pinkle and the Witch, which I had put my mother through so many times, Charlie the Crane, it only had eight lines and it just drove me mad. So at a certain point I thought, he's got hundreds of board books, he'll never know the difference. So I opened the kitchen bin and I, I pushed the, the Charlie the Crane book in, hid it away and walked away. And then of course I felt terrible. I thought it's his favorite book. There I am throwing it away. What kind of mother am I? So I got it out and cleaned it, and read it to him again that night. And when years later I told him that story you know, to illustrate how much I loved him, he was outraged that Charlie the Crane had been even temporarily in the kitchen <laughs> garbage. So then when I came to write Room and I wanted to capture that mingled magic and hellishness of um, motherhood, I decided to use Charlie the Crane, but I didn't want to insult the writer of Charlie the Crane. So I fictionalized it as, here's Dylan, the friendly digger. And Dylan even ended up in, in the movie and an artist in Toronto had the job of actually mock, mocking up this book of Dylan, the digger. Um, 
the last thing I would say about stories is that they are short. Even long stories are short, meaning they are shorter than life. So no matter how epic a story you're telling, there is a process of compaction, much like, I suppose, you know, squeezing Charlie the Crane into that kitchen garbage. There, there's a, you literally cut corners, you edit things down. So after I've decided who's telling the story, then I fret about which bit to show and how narrow a slice uh, can I reduce it to? Do I have to tell you the whole life or is it possible I could come in and show you just one week in someone's life? Um, you, you telescope events, for instance. I often write very fact-based fiction, but I try and arrange the events in a shorter time frame than they really happened, which I suppose explains so many of those 20-second meeting scenes you see in some great business shows like Succession, where people walk into the room and say, just get it fucking done and walk out again. You know? <laughs> it's, it's narrative economy. And my time is up. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>
She had never seen an apple before. But somebody on the boat cut that apple into so many pieces and gave as many people as possible a bit of that apple. And she said that as a little girl, she had this one little taste of that apple. Shortly after that, they were rescued and they arrived in Canada where they lived. But that woman said to this day, she can never eat an apple without remembering that first delicious experience of that fruit. We all have stories of how we came to be here. Even indigenous people often came from other parts of Turtle Island. And their ancestors passed down stories to them as we share our stories with our children, as they were passed to us as children. In North Winnipeg, when I was a kid, we lived surrounded by people who were from other countries. They'd come to Canada escaping war and tyranny and poverty. They were from Ukraine, they were from Lithuania, they were from Poland, there were Slovaks and Germans and Jews. Jews who still had the tattoos on their arms, the numbers that were put there. And they still had the emotional scars we could not see. My own grandmother came from Poland. She wasn't supposed to. My family, her family, had spent all the money they had to buy tickets and travel documents from my grandmother's older sister. The night before she was to depart, the sister broke into wails and tears. She said she wouldn't go, she could not go. She argued with her parents all night. And shortly before dawn, her parents gave in. They had only one option left to them. They went into my grandmother's room and shook her. Wake up, May. You're leaving for Canada. She was 17 years old. She traveled alone. She crossed an ocean and then a continent. She came with almost nothing. But as a family, we have treasured and shared that story. It's in our DNA, and we pass it on to our kids and my grandchildren now. As children in Winnipeg, we went to people, other people's houses where the food was strange, the smells, the languages were all foreign. But I remember everyone had some kind of cookies. All the cookies were good. They were all wonderful. But all those people also had different stories of how they got there, what had happened to them, who they left behind, what they took with them. I loved the cookies. I came to eventually love their stories, and I think that's why I became a journalist, so I could hear more of those kinds of stories. So over the years, I've interviewed people, I've learned that everybody has a story that defines them. And the stories they have told me have filled me with awe and wonder at the resilience of people. And they have filled me with shock and disbelief at the cruelty of others. But each time I hear a story, I put myself in their shoes, and the barriers between us fall away, and I begin to care. And then I share those stories with you, and we share in their humanity. And they are no longer strangers. They are no longer the other. They're no longer what Don Cherry would call you people. We identify with them. And then we are the ones crossing a stormy sea in a flimsy rubber raft with our children. We are the ones scrambling through a mountain pass carrying our ailing mother. We are the ones confronting razor wire and hostile border guards with tear gas. We are leaving behind all that's familiar and seeking a safe haven, a new home, because there's no future where we come from. For most of us, our stories are much less dramatic, but they're fraught with difficulty. In the last century, people came from Europe, mostly. In later years, people came from China, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, all over Africa, and they arrived with very little. And they opened restaurants down on Richmond Street, and they worked in our parking garages, and they still do downtown. And they washed dishes in our hotels, and they drive taxis around our cities, and they clean our houses, and their children go to school, and they grow up with dreams, and they realize those dreams. But in every one of those stories you'll hear, if you ask them for their story, that there are people along the way who heard those stories and helped them, who listened to them, who understood, 
who identified with a stranger and made it easier, and even those from earlier centuries were indigenous people who helped our settlers, otherwise we wouldn't be here now. I wish I had been with my parents when they met that refugee family from Vietnam. I wish I'd heard those stories about the dangerous escape and shared the sense of humanity. I would have liked to see my parents how much they would have enjoyed and felt about those stories and how delighted they would have been to hear about that apple. One of my favorite writers, the late Richard Wagamies, describes it best in his Canada poem. And it's ironic that an Ojibwe man had the best understanding of what this country is, but he did. Richard wrote that the name Canada means home, but he believes it also means campfire, that home is a campfire. And he believed that Canada is actually a place where people come from all around the world, all are strangers, but then they sit at this campfire and they tell their story and everyone listens all we carry forward and all we leave behind are our stories. It's who we are. It's what defines us. And as we tell the stories, we are no longer strangers or enemies or anyone to be feared. We are no longer different ethnicities or colors. We are no longer you people. We are just one race, the human race, sitting here as we are tonight, telling our stories around this great campfire we call Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Off. Thank you, Courtney Gilmore, Susan Coyne, Eternity Martis, Jesse Thistle, Casey Plett, and Emma Donahue. Uh, Emma's right. We called her yesterday. <laughs> we had booked uh, another talker who unfortunately yesterday called us to say um, that she had fallen ill. And we knew that Emma was coming tonight as a civilian because she was on the guest list. So we uh, called her, which isn't the, the extraordinary thing. The extraordinary thing is she said yes. So thank you very much. <clears throat> because we're standing at the grand the in the Grand Theater, I wanna tell you that the room by Emma Donahue um, is being, um, that a, a, a stage production, the North American premiere of Room, based on the best-selling book, The Room, will be happening right here uh, at the Grand Theatre opening March 10th. Yes, it's very exciting. Whether we realize it or not, and as Carol Off has said, we are all storytellers. I'd like to invite one more storyteller to the stage to say a few words. Please welcome the President of the Arts and Humanities Student Council, Jerrica Kaduhada. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jerrica Kaduhada. I'm the President of the Arts and Humanities Students Council at Western. Um, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be up here tonight. I could not be more thrilled to have a night dedicated to something as timeless and fundamental as storytelling. In all of my time reading and studying stories, and it's been a while considering English literature is my major, um, I've learned one fairly simple thing about them. We use them to understand ourselves and our world. But even in this world of ours, there exists infinite micro worlds. We've just heard some of them tonight. Um, because the world that you experience is vastly different from the one I live. The magic of stories, the true magic of stories, is that they allow for empathy. There are few better ways to understand someone than to hear their memories and ideas presented in the language that is only and truly their own. Last year, a professor taught me that the entire history of storytelling can be distilled into seven basic stories. Overcoming the Master, Rags to Riches, The Quest, voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, and rebirth.
My own story consists of several subplots of these seven. Immigrating from the Philippines to Canada, voyage and return. Surviving high school bullies, overcoming the master. Working towards my bachelor's degree while confronting the reality of student debt, the quest. <laughs> I'm really hoping for a happy ending on that one. <laughs> the list goes on. If you were to look into exactly what these stories are, you'd probably realize that you've undergone them too. The wonder fa wonderful fact that emerges from this is that we, across time and space, all share something. This is an amazing thing to have in a country as vibrant and diverse as ours. The nurturing of empathy and harmony is much easier with this commonality. Even in our students' council at Western, recognition of this commonality and understanding of the stories of others has been invaluable. Our council is a student advocacy body for all arts and humanities students at Western. Each project we undertake, each event we hold, and each concern we address is built from an attempt to consider other stories and how they intersect on our campus. Any member of my council can tell you that stories do not exist merely for entertainment. They are glimpses into the lives of others, tools for understanding things outside of and greater than us. I think after talks as inspiring as the ones tonight, it is important to remember that these stories hold significance even past the moments that they are told. They are filled with knowledge that can guide us on how to coexist in this world. It has been such an honor to listen to the stories shared on this stage. I am so happy to see so many people, including fellow Western students, coming together for a Tuesday night of storytelling. Thank you to the Walrus and all its generous sponsors for hosting this event, and thank you to you all for joining us. I hope that you carry with you the stories from tonight. Perhaps you may hear a few more or even share your own in the reception that now follows. May you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again. Thank you, Jerrica. I am at this moment going to ask the audience to stick with me for a couple of more minutes while I get our talkers to stand up. Uh, and the talkers are going to go uh, through the auditorium into the reception area first. You can, yes, you can clap. Yes, thanks all. <laughs> Off you go. Jerrica, go that way. Yep, there you go. <clears throat> you will see them again. You will see them at the, at the reception. The reason we do that is I know you want to talk to them and they want to talk to you, but they don't want to be trapped in their row when you try to talk to them afterwards. That's why we set them free. Um, we've now produced 122 evenings like this on every subject you can think of. That means there are now over 800 walrus talkers and 800 seven-minute walrus talks videos that you can watch for free, thanks to our sponsors, wherever and whenever you want. Just visit our YouTube channel, which you can find at thewalrus.ca. You can also subscribe. Remember those people that I really liked at the beginning? <laughs> the subscribers? You too can be those people. You can subscribe at thewalrus.ca, but it's way easier to do it tonight. The Walrus team will be at the reception. There's a big table. And you can, uh, just for you tonight, you can get a full year's print subscription to the Walrus for just 25 bucks. That's 10 issues a year. I don't have to tell you that fake news is cheap. And fact-based journalism is not. Um, you know, yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday there was a bit of fake news on one of our most beloved authors. The news looked like it came from McClellan and Stewart Publishers 10 o'clock yesterday morning that Alice Monroe had died. Everybody leapt on it, and our team at the Walrus knew within 30 seconds that it was fake news, and we were able to tell people that. Um, so, I ask you to please consider joining our community of more than 2,000 donors across the country who support our work um, and the work that the journalists and everybody at the Walrus does every day. The best news is that every dollar you give us tonight is going to be matched. We have a couple, uh, Tim and Francis Price, that will, will, will double 
any amount that you give to the walrus actually between now and, the, and December 31st. So if you give $10, it becomes 20. And if you give $100, it becomes 200. And you get a tote bag <laughs> for the 100 and above. And that too can happen out there at that table. You can also sign up for our newsletter out there. That's free. And that will tell you when we are next coming to a town near you. And then you won't miss any other walrus talks. At this time, I'd like to thank all of our national partners, Air Canada, Inspire, Labatt, and Shaw for being with us across the country. Thank you again to Western University for making tonight possible. In particular, Dean Michael Milde, Jessica Schlagrell, Joe Jennings, and of course, President Shepard. So please join us at the reception. You can buy books from our talkers there and you can find them and they will sign them. There's a separate table. Our friends at Adventure Canada are here tonight. You can enter to win a once in a lifetime $20,000 trip uh, from Resolute Bay, Nunavut, um, from Resolute Bay, Nunavut to Greenland. Probably return. <laughs> You'll have to check. If you get maybe just to Greenland, not really sure. So join us at the reception. There is food, there is drink, and if you're there, there will be very good conversation. And always remember one other thing is that we're not actually the walrus. You are the walrus. Thank you for coming.